All right, it's the end of the week here on The Morning Pit, youtube.com slash panthalair.com. I'm Chris Peak from panthalair.com. You know that website by now. If you don't, you should. <clears throat> Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. You can find it all at panthalair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, and of course our video wing here at youtube.com slash panthalair.com, where we bring you every day of the week, Monday through Friday, the morning pit. Get your day started. A little bit of pit news, pit talk, pit uh, conversation, just uh, 15, 20, 25 minutes of talking about pit and whatever's going on in the world of pit, and obviously there's been a lot going on. Um, lately we have a lot to, uh, discuss today, but make sure you like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You subscribe right down there is the uh, subscribe button. That way you'll never miss any of our exclusive pit video content. You can turn on notifications. So you get an alert sent to your phone every time we post a new morning pit video, or every time we go live for, uh, whether it's our Wednesday night Panther Lair show or a post game show, like we did on Wednesday night after the North Carolina game, that was a lot of fun. And we had a big crowd show up on a Wednesday night at 9.30 and talk about pit sports for a while right here at youtube.com slash So you want to make sure you don't miss any of those things. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on notifications and you won't miss anything <clears throat> that we do. Um, for today, since it's the end of the week, we made it through the week, I thought we could, uh, and this might be a thing we do on Fridays from here on out, just sort of talk about anything that went on this week. I got a handful of topics that I wrote down here. Um to discuss as we go through it, uh, just what happened this week. And I mean, I, I think obviously the biggest thing that happened this week, it starts on Wednesday night with the win at North Carolina, pit 65, 64. And, and I mean, we talked a lot about that on the morning pit yesterday. We talked a lot about it on the, um, you know, the post game show on Wednesday night you could listen to that podcast yesterday. It's, it's still available on our YouTube page. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of, you know, we broke down a lot of angles from that game. But here's one more than I thought about yesterday. Kind of popped into my head as, as I was thinking about the end of the game. And I was actually, um, <laughs> I, I forget if uh, it was a conversation on Twitter or I think I was actually explaining to my kids what happened in the game. My kids are young. They went to bed probably around halftime. Um, and they always, you know, the next day they always said, Dad, who won the game last night? Who won the game? They would always ask about pit football and basketball games, ask about the Steeler games and stuff like that. You know, who won the game last night? Who won the game last night? So, oh, Pitt won the game. It was 65 60, And they always asked, what was the score? And I said, it was 65 64. I'm like, oh, okay. And, uh, and I explained to them what happened at the end of the game, how it went down. You know, Pitt gets the ball. They're down 64 63. They call a timeout, 23.7 seconds to go. And uh, Jamarius Burton, they're familiar with that name. It's not their favorite name. Their favorite name on the team is Federico Federico. So I had to take a brief sidetrack and tell them about Armando Baycott and how good he is. And, you know, who, who do you think Pitt got to defend him? And they said, oh, was it Jamarius Burton? I said, no, it's a bit of a height difference, but it was Federico Federico. And they were excited by that. That's, that's I think that's their, I don't know if it's their favorite player, but it's their favorite name on the team. So I'm explaining the end of the game to him. I'm talking about Pitt calls a timeout with 23.7 seconds to go. And they bring the ball in and it's Burton. And everybody knows it's going to be Burton and this and that. And I explain the whole, how it all went down with the foul and everything. And as I'm explaining it, I'm thinking to myself, boy, this sounds familiar. This, the, you know, the whole sort of situation kind of feels familiar. Um... I was, I was experiencing deja vu as I was explaining this. I'm like, why am I having deja vu? What am I thinking of? And then it occurred to me. It was the end of the Miami game. Almost the exact same situation. Pitt was up 69-68. Miami gets the ball, brings it up over half court. They call a timeout 25.4 seconds. So instead of, whereas Pitt at North Carolina called timeout with 23.7 seconds, Miami calls timeout with 25.4 seconds, right? They call timeout. And coming out of that timeout at, at, in the Miami game, and, and I, I said this after the game, it, it was one of my, you know, I, I thought it was one of, I mean, it was the biggest moment. It was the game-winning play. Um, you know, I said, everybody knew what was going to happen coming out of that timeout. Everybody knew Isaiah Wong was getting the ball and he was going to have a chance to make a play to win the game. That was the deja vu moment because 
23.7 seconds at Carolina. Pitt calls a timeout. They're down one. Coming out of that timeout, everybody knew what was going to happen. I knew, you knew, probably the entire arena knew. North Carolina definitely knew. Just like in the Miami game, you knew, I knew, the entire arena knew, Pitt knew. In that game, Isaiah Wong was going to make a play to, to try to win the game. It was going to be him. He was going to take the ball, you know, probably run off a screen, and, and try to make a play to win. And either make the basket or draw the foul. Similarly, they go to Chapel Hill on Wednesday night, 23.7 seconds. They come out of a timeout. You know what's going to happen. It's Jamarius Burton. He's going to get the ball. And, and when they were talking on, t- on TV, well, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. They could either try and get a quick shot if they get a good look, or they're going to try and run the clock down. We all knew they were going to try to run the clock down. We all knew they weren't going to um, you know, try to get a quick shot. They were going to put the ball in Jamarius Burton's hands. He was going to run the clock down, and then he was going to try and make a play to win the game. He was either going to make a shot or he was going to draw a foul. In that case, he draws a foul. Goes to the free throw line, makes both, and wins the game. Isaiah Wong drives into the lane, tries to go for a shot or draw a foul, and ends up getting the ball stolen from Jamarius Burton. It's interesting to stack those two next to each other. Two almost identical situations. When you're talking about two of the best guards in the conference, maybe two guys that, that, you know, for some voters, it might come down to Wong or Burton voting for that all-conference team. And I mean, in reality, you should vote for both of them. But it it might, you know, maybe for a voter, it might come down, oh, am I going to vote for Burton or am I going to vote for Why? I got to have a a, a Carolina guy. I got to have a Duke guy. Uh, you know, well, you know, maybe I have this, maybe I have that. Oh, am I going to pick Jamarius Burton or am I going to pick Isaiah Wong? Well, here you have back-to-back games with almost identical situations. And I was going to say in one game, Burton makes a play and in the other game, Wong doesn't. But the reality is in one game, Burton makes a play offensively. And in the other game, Burton makes a play defensively. He wins the game in both situations with his play in almost the same exact scenario, almost identical scenarios. It's funny how it played out like that, how you had almost a, a identical repeat, um, just with a, a different outcome. Although, in a way, the outcome was the same because both times, Jamarius Burton won. Just a, a, a huge performance from him in both of those games to win You know, two, two huge wins for Pitt, two of Pitt's biggest wins of the season, back-to-back games, coming down to the end in a one-point situation, and uh, Burton makes the plays the win. So... Big kudos to Jamarius Burton there. You know, as this season has moved along, um, and as Pitt has continued to win and, and be more successful and look like they might be one of the best teams in the ACC, there's been sort of a peripheral conversation about the coach of the year and whether Jeff Capel, uh, you know, what, what his chances are, basically, is what it comes down to. And, um, You know, somebody said it on Twitter, and I think I probably agree, that there's at this point, with another eight games left to play, there's probably three main candidates uh, for that Coach of the Year spot. And Jeff Capel is one of them. Brad Brownell from uh, Clemson is one. And Kevin Keats from NC State will be the third. And those will be the, sort of the three top guys. And, I mean, you're looking at, you know, Capel obviously at Pitt, 16-7 and seven overall, 9-3 and three in the conference. Clemson is 18-5, and 10-2. And NC State is 18 and 5, 8 and 4. And I think the biggest thing you look at is the turnaround. You know, Clemson had the best record out of those three last year, and they were barely over 500 overall. They were 17 and 16 overall, 8 and 12 in ACC play. NC State actually was worse than Pitt last year. Um, Pitt, both teams were actually 11 and 21 overall. Pitt went 6 and 14 in the league, uh, NC State went 4 and 16. And so in that sense, NC State's turnaround has actually been even better than Pitt's. I think we're a little biased around here because we've seen the lows that this program has experienced over the past few years up close and personal. And and when I say over the past few years, we're basically talking since Jamie Dixon left. So you're talking about seven years or so of mediocre to straight up bad basketball prior to this year. And, and that, colors our judgment, I think, and and leads us to feel like Capel's turnaround is even bigger than what Keats has done in NC State. And I would I would actually contend that that's not a incorrect perception. I think we're right. I think it is a bigger turnaround. Year to year, from last season to this season, 
you know, favors NC State ever so slightly. They have more wins overall this year, and they had a worse ACC record last year. Uh, but looking at a bigger picture than that, looking at a picture of not just last season to this year, but the last five years to this year, the last six years to this year, I mean, it's hard for me to pick against Capel. Pitt has been one of the worst programs, not just one of the worst teams, but one of the worst programs in the ACC for quite some time. Maybe the worst. You know, certainly going winless in conference will put you in that conversation. And to turn it around to a point where it is now, where this team is legitimately a contender for the ACC regular season title and should enter enter the ACC tournament as a team that, you know, very well may not play until Thursday. You know, like may get buys through the first two rounds and make its first appearance in the conference tournament in the quarterfinals. I mean, that's where they position themselves right now, and that's where they should, in theory, you know, given what the rest of the schedule looks like, that's where they should end up is not playing until Thursday of the ACC tournament. And if they can do that, if they can position themselves like that, if they can keep up what they've been doing, maybe win the regular season title, you know, enter as one of the top four seeds in the ACC tournament, I have a hard time picking against Capel. With these three teams, it might come down, for Capel, Brownell, and Keats, it might come down to who finishes highest in the regular season. Honestly, I, and, and and it might just be that simple. Um, I'm biased like you are. I think Capel is the guy. I mean, I think, you know, the turnaround, as I said, not just from last season to this season, but from the last six seasons to this season is really remarkable and more than Brownell or Keats have done, uh, you know, year to year. But... Uh, it's tough. You know, it's tough. And like I say, it might come down to who finish has the best record, who who finishes highest in the regular season standings. If one of these three teams wins the conference regular season title, I would say that coach is probably going to get the coach of the year. Um, but Cable absolutely is in consideration. And, and quite frankly, if he wins the ACC regular season, uh, not only should he be ACC coach of the year, but he should be a candidate for national coach of the year. I, I mean, I really think the turnaround is that significant and, and that impressive that if he could pull that off, I um, think he would be in the consideration nationally. And he should be. Uh, he should be. Um, on the football side, I mean, the schedule came out this week. We talked a lot about that in the morning pit. Uh, you know, not, not too many new thoughts to add there. It, it's... <clears throat> it's it's one of these schedules. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the one thing I would say is because there's been so much conversation and, ta- and, and talk about overscheduling and, and pit overscheduling. Oh, they've got three Power 5 teams in the non-conference this year with West Virginia, Cincinnati, and Notre Dame. That's overscheduling. They have to stop doing that. They have to stop b- loading up the schedules like this. Well, they didn't load up the schedule like this. The ACC puts Notre Dame on the schedule. That accounts for one of the Power 5 teams. Cincinnati... It actually isn't even a Power 5 team right now. They'll be a Power 5 team on like July 1st when they're officially entered into the Big 12. So they weren't scheduled as a Power 5 team. So that takes care of the second one. And then the third one is West Virginia. You're not going to turn down a series with West Virginia, just like you're not going to turn down a series with Notre Dame. Or excuse me, with Penn State. And if you know if Penn State came to you right now, they have, they have some Notre Dame games on the schedule um, down the road. Let me let me find that. Uh, we just published uh, a thing today on um, future series and stuff like that. So Pitt is scheduled to play Notre Dame in 2000. Let's find a good example. 34, 33, 34, and 36. Okay. 2033, 34, and 36. They have a West Virginia series from 2029 to 32. And then they have Notre Dame 33, 34, and 36. If Penn State came and said, we want to play a four-game series, 2033 through 36, which would give you overlapping Penn State and Notre Dame games in the same season, three out of those four years. Pitt would not say no, and nor should they. They would not say, and nor should they say, I'm sorry, we already have a Power 5 opponent for three out of those four years. We can't add you. Those series are too good and too important and too valuable to turn them down just because it might make your schedule a little more competitive. You're not going to turn down the West Virginia or Penn State series. 
You're going to get those on the book as often as you can. Those, I will never point to those two series. Anytime you have a chance to play West Virginia or Penn State, I will never point to those two series and say they should not have scheduled that. Now, the Oklahoma State series in 2016 and 17, they should not have scheduled that. There was no reason to play that series. That gave you two Power 5 opponents in both of those years. You already had Penn State on the schedule. That's enough. You didn't need to add Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State does nothing for you. Tennessee, okay, I like that series. It's unfortunate. I I guess the scheduling, the way it had to work out, it overlapped with West Virginia for one year. Um, Wisconsin, I think that's an interesting series, a good series. Uh, And that... um, doesn't overlap with any actually as as i kind of glance through it the first game of that series is in 2026 that game's on the road and then 27 they play in pittsburgh um i i don't mind that you know 20 2025 you're gonna have west virginia and notre dame at the same time um but other than that you know and i guess 2024 you've got the second game of the cincinnati series so you're gonna have two big 12 teams in cincinnati and west virginia Uh, but again you didn't schedule cincinnati as a power five opponent now granted when they scheduled the Cincinnati series, uh, I think it was in like 2015 or so, Cincinnati was fresh off back-to-back 10-win seasons. So it wasn't exactly like they were slumping at that point. But they weren't a Power 5 opponent. Uh, you didn't over-schedule in putting this schedule together. It came together because you wanted the West Virginia series. You scheduled a group of five series with Cincinnati, and the ACC puts Notre Dame on your schedule. That's out of your control. There have been times when Pitt has overscheduled. This isn't one of them. It's not. And, and I don't really see much in the future where I say, God, they got to stop overscheduling. Now, look, the reality is the schedule in 2021 when they played, uh, who was their FCS? They played New Hampshire. They opened against um, UMass. Right, They opened against UMass, they went to Tennessee, they hosted Western Michigan, and they hosted New Hampshire in that order in September. That's about as good as it's going to get. I mean, that is an ideal schedule. FCS, two group of five, and one power five. That's an ideal non-conference schedule. Um, You'd like to do that every year. And I know, like... Some fans crack me up. They say, I, I don't want to watch that. Well, you want to watch your team win, right? You're going to get plenty of opportunities to see them play against legitimate Power 5 competition. In those non-conference games, you might as well stack as many wins as you can. Get one good competitive opponent and stack wins against FCS and Group of 5 teams so that you know you have a better chance of getting to 9 and 10 and 11 wins. And I mean, 2021 was set up that way. They should have had... <laughs> they should have won all four of those games. We know that it went wrong in the Western Michigan game. Um, but that was the ideal schedule. Uh, I, I, you know, For me, uh, I think that was the ideal schedule. You're just going to have some instances where that Notre Dame series, when Notre Dame gets put on the schedule by the ACC, that's going to kind of interfere a little bit. And then uh, there's nothing you can do about that. Then you end up with schedules that have Notre Dame and West Virginia or 2018. They had Notre Dame and Penn state. In addition to UCF, who was a group of five team, uh, just happened to be really good at the time when Pitt came up on their schedule. So did Pitt over schedule this year? I don't think so. They haven't really over scheduled too many of the seasons that are yet to come. Um, the Oklahoma state series is that one that really stands out and you say, you just didn't need to do that. All right. And then final thing, um, this week, this might be a surprise to you. Maybe this is breaking news. Dun, 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 dun. We need like a breaking news horn or something like that. Uh, yeah. And I did just sing the Monday night football theme song for breaking news because that's the first thing that came to mind. Um, signing day was this week. Did you know this? Did you notice? <laughs> I kind of made that those two sound the same. Know this and notice. Did anybody know? That signing day was on Wednesday. I mean, I mean, you probably did. If you watch this, these videos, you read PantherLair.com, you probably know that signing day was on Wednesday. Um, kind of passed without really anyone noticing. I mean, and granted, you know, Pitt had nothing doing on signing day. They actually had a press conference. It was so we could talk to Lamar Seymour, freshman wide receiver, and Christian Vare, uh, transfer quarterback, who clarified that he does pronounce it Vare. And Dejon Reynolds, 
transfer wide receiver. That was what we had for the signing day press conference. It wasn't a signing day press conference. It was just an opportunity to interview those guys. Uh, And Pitt was not alone. Most schools across the country didn't have a whole lot going on uh, on signing day, February 2023. And the reality is there was not much to pay attention to nationally. I looked, I I think, out of the rivals, the top 250, the top 250 prospects in the class of 2023, 239 of the 250 signed in December. They'll have 11 guys. 11 guys out of the top 250 prospects in the class who did not sign in December. Those were the guys who were up in the air heading into this past Wednesday, signing day, February signing day. And out of those 11, actually like six were already committed or five were already committed. So there was only five or six guys in the whole, in the top 250 prospects in the country, only five or six that were actually still undecided, had any drama around their signing day. And I think probably one or two of them had some sort of uh, extracurricular issues that might've delayed their recruitment or changed their recruitment. It's just not, like the the focus of the recruiting calendar has shifted to December. And that's a shame because December doesn't have the juice that February did. It's still exciting and it's a big deal and everybody talks about it and everybody gets fired up, but not nearly like they did in February, like they used to in February, five years ago or 10 years ago, February, the first Wednesday in February was a big freaking deal. Now the third Wednesday in December is a pretty big deal. The, there, there, there are free problems with the, there. There are a few problems with the December signing day becoming the signing day, and and one of the biggest that I can think of is that February signing day, when it was the only signing day, really ha- was able to capture the attention of the college football world. I, I mean, it was the thing that was going on. December signing day, third Wednesday in December, you're still only a couple weeks removed from the end of the regular season and the conference championship games. Most teams and schools still have their bowl game left to play, right? So you st- and then obviously the, the playoffs and the national championship game haven't happened yet. The New Year's Six Bowls haven't happened yet. You still very much feel like you're in the middle of the season, right? And plus it's like the third week in December. There's a whole lot going on in life at that time of year. And so you pay a lot of attention to signing day in December. You're focused on signing day in December. It's exciting. You're following along with it and everybody's looking at everything and all that stuff. But like, it's not, there are other things to distract you. And it does, it feels, I mean, like I say, it's almost overshadowed by the fact that it still kind of feels like it's in the season. When you get to February, you're like a month removed from the last game. You're still a month out from the start of spring camp. You're in sort of a dead space of college football you're usually in between the nfl conference championship games and the super bowl so you're in that kind of dead area uh college basketball is obviously going on but as far as college football is you know goes there's nothing else happening and so signing day could really capture everyone you know and 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 the thing about signing day what signing day ultimately represents is is it's the one day on the calendar year in college football that is just optimism, unbridled optimism. And yes, the, the most cynical among us can find things to be disappointed about and negative about. But for the vast majority, everybody's a champion on signing day. Everybody wins on signing day. The press conferences are great. All the players are going to come in and win national championships. Everybody's excited to compete and play. And these are the players that are going to help turn the pro, blah, 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 blah. blah. It's an exciting day. And that's an easier sell when you're in the middle of or early February and nothing else is going on. It's a little bit tougher when you still feel like you're in the middle of the season. You know, it's a it's a little bit tougher to sort of generate that off-season optimism when you're still like I say, it feels like you're still playing. I mean, like December 21st or whatever it was this year, I think Pitt was still practicing. Pitt was practicing for the Sun Bowl. So they were a couple weeks out from the end of the from the Miami game at the end of the regular season, but they were practicing. I mean, they were still in season for all intents and purposes, and it just makes it not feel quite as exciting. You know, it, 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 there, there's an excitement level, but it's it's here. It's not like it was here or there, which is what it was when February the first Wednesday in February was the only signing day. I don't know if there's a way to fix it. 
I don't know if it ultimately needs to be fixed. I mean, we're just talking about fan interest and fan excitement. It's disappointing because it used to be a really big deal and now it's not. The focus has shifted almost entirely to December and that's probably not going to change. Coaches will keep complaining about it and ultimately they might make some change to the calendar, but I doubt it's ever going to get back to what it was when there was one big signing day out of season, an off-season signing day that could really get everybody fired up and uh, be sort of a holiday like it was, like it used to be. But some things change and uh, it's not going to be like it was. What are you going to do? We, 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 you feel really old when you start th- talking about things in those terms, you know, and that's sort of, uh, how I feel, but all right, that's the big, those are the big things that happened this week. At least the ones that I'm interested in talking about today. Hope you had a good week and enjoyed, uh, everything that went down for you and for Pitt and all those things. And appreciate you watching these morning pit videos throughout the week. Uh, enjoy putting them together. Enjoy having, uh, these little conversations every morning and I appreciate you watching it. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's an off weekend for pit, ba- pit basketball. We can all just sort of take it easy for a little bit and look forward to the final eight games of the season here. Should be a fun ride. So thanks for checking out the videos this week. Hope you had a great week. Hope you have a great Friday and a great weekend. And we'll be back right here on Monday morning for another Morning Pit right here on YouTube.com slash